There is a specific time I remember because of how two people packed. We were at a family get together in Connecticut. And one of the family members had a car full of stuff. I mean, there were toasters and fans, there were suitcases and food. There was anything that you could possibly need in that car, fire extinguishers, everything, so that if anything happened, she was prepared. And then there was my grandmother who was packing to go home with one of my aunts. And she had a suitcase that's like this big, okay? And bright pink, because pink was her favorite color. And into that suitcase, she would put two dresses, a pair of pajamas, her toothbrush and toothpaste and a brush. Because she believed that all along the way there would be people who would help her. Like she could go from her house in Connecticut to our house in Wisconsin in that little suitcase. And she would stop along the way at every second cousin, third cousin, twice removed people that she knew and would receive welcome. She would receive a night's stay and food to eat. How many of you pack like my grandmother? Or do you pack like my mother-in-law? How many of you Take everything but the kitchen sink in your car when you go on a trip. How many of you hope and believe that there's enough? I was listening to the, the story core that they did on um, Marsha Darnell. And at the end of it, they talk about how Marsha and her husband I think his name was Bill, um, with, when they were young, er, they would travel to all the people that they knew when they had been stationed in Japan. And on those visits, they didn't take a lot with them and they didn't have a lot of hotel bills because they knew they were welcome in the spare room, that they would spend the night with those they encountered. They would share their memories that the connection they had with each other didn't leave just because it had been 10, 15, 20 years since they last saw each other. The stories and laughter flowed. In today's scripture, Jesus sends the disciples out and says, don't take anything. Now, I tend to pack like my grandmother, maybe a little more than her. My suitcase is not quite that small, but it's pretty small. But I don't know that I would take nothing, right? I want an extra pair of shoes because if you go out at night, you don't want to wear your tennis shoes that you walk around in during the day, right? You want to look nice. He says, take nothing. No food. No protection, no money, nothing. Take nothing. How many of us are willing to do that? Like, I'm the one of you who is the closest to this, right? I had to pack up all my stuff to move it out here in the last few months. And I got rid of lots of stuff, let me tell you. You can collect amazing amounts of stuff over seven years. And still, unpacking all those boxes, I have more stuff than a person needs, especially books. And yet I have that invitation, send me. How do we deal with this scripture about being sent? About being called to go out into the world I think it's a tough question for us to ask ourselves. But I think I want to spend time with in the second scripture I read. So in the first scripture, Jesus sends out the disciples, right? He sends out the 12 to go ahead of him. And when they come back, they tell about their experiences. They share what they encountered. 
And we learn that there are people that don't hear the good news and don't want to hear it. Or there are people who hear the good news and accept it, but something gets in the way. And then he decides to send out more people. 72 people. He sends out 72 people. And I think these people are probably the people that are described in Luke 8, 1 through 3, where Jesus talks about the people that come along with him. He specifically lays out the women who are there supporting and upholding him. The people in this group of 72 are the people who Jesus helped, healed, cured, cast out evil, freed from oppression. I mean, in Luke 8, he talks about a woman who had 10 demons that she was freed from. And a woman who was cured of illness. And so I think those 72 people now that are being sent out aren't his apprentices. They're the people who've experienced the kingdom of God. The people who know what it means to have God draw near, right? And so Jesus tells them the same thing. Don't take anything. Again, you wonder who has enough courage to do that. To believe that when you arrive somewhere, that people will be there to help you. And then he talks about what do you say when you encounter these people, these new people in these new towns. And the first thing he says is when you enter a town and enter a house, say, peace be on this house. And if that peace enters the person, leave it there. But if it enters no one, take it back with you. I find that kind of funny, right? Like, how do you take something back that you've given? How do you, how do you give someone else peace? And so I think that makes us have to stop and think about what peace is. In the Greek and Hebrew tradition, peace isn't just the absence of conflict, the absence of violence. Peace is about wholeness and restoration. It's about being brought back into community. It's about being whole in whatever it was that set you apart from God. Peace is a concept that is bigger and broader than what we talk about when we say peace. And so when those disciples say, peace be on this house, they're inviting the wholeness of God into that place. They're inviting into those houses the presence of God. And they have that presence in themselves. Because in those 72 people, the ones who had experienced the kingdom of God, that's what they had, right? They were given wholeness. They were given and received from Jesus that peace that they hadn't had before. That sense that they are enough, that they are well, that they are good. And so when they enter those houses, that wholeness, that experience that they had of the presence of God goes with them into that place. And when they enter that house, there are people who receive that presence who feel that wholeness, who feel that God has come into that house and changed their lives. But he also says something else, that sometimes it doesn't happen. That sometimes people don't encounter or feel that peace and wholeness that you're willing to share with others. They don't experience how God has moved in their lives. 
And in that case, your job isn't to badger them or change them. Your job isn't to tell them, no, no, really, really, I've got this. I understand who God is. I feel God within me. You aren't to do that. You're just to leave. I mean, think about what that means for us in this culture. Right now, we argue a lot about a lot of things. It isn't saying don't have the discussion, right? Don't talk about wholeness. Don't talk about what it means to be at peace. But it is saying that there are some places and people where you're welcome where your words, where your expression of who God is, is not going to be wanted or desired. And it's okay to move on to the next house, to move on to the next town. How would you say to the people you encounter, in our current language, peace beyond this house. What words would you use to bring that sense to other people? But those aren't the only words Jesus invites us to share with others. He invites us as we enter the town to share that the kingdom of God has drawn near, has come close. What does that feel like and look like to say those words? The kingdom of God has come near. Now, I tend not to change the word kingdom, but new words of saying that New ways of saying kingdom are community, realm, kingdom, family. The idea that now, present here, close by, that God is present. And how do they show that? Because what Jesus does as he sends those disciples out is to say to them, share the kingdom, heal the sick, free people from evil. So they experience the kingdom of God drawing near when wholeness comes into their lives. When they are freed from all those things that prevent them from being whole. Whatever it is. Whether it's their separation from the people around them. Whether it's alcohol or drugs. Whether it's mental illness. Whatever it is that keeps them from being whole. When the disciples and the 72 come into town, they have been given the power to bring that wholeness, to bring that freedom, to bring that peace to people who aren't at peace. But here's the interesting thing again. Jesus says, if they accept it, when you say the kingdom of God has drawn near, if they accept it, stay there with them. Eat the food that's put in front of you. That's a hard one there, right? How many of you have gone to somebody's house and you look at the food and you go, oh, I'm not sure I can eat that. And you're invited to welcome their culture in, to take a bite of that food and experience what nourishes them. And to show and share with them how the kingdom of God has drawn near. How would you talk about that? How would you say to someone in today's language that God 
is here and near you? What story would you share? Would you tell about a time when God was real and present in your life? A time when God's presence made all the difference? So when I was younger, and first starting in my ministry, God and I had a radio thing, okay? So I know this sounds weird, but anytime I was feeling in the need of advice, the right song would either appear on the radio or in my ear. And it may not even be a song I really knew, but it was that words and phrases that I needed to hear. And one time, they're in a point in time where the church was going to have to reduce my salary by half and my work by half. And I was wondering how me and my son were going to survive and what we were going to do. I'm driving in the car. And because this is when Reed was little, I tend to listen to radio stations that I didn't have to worry about explaining things I didn't want to explain. So I happened to have Caleb on at the time. And a song had just finished. And God said to me, I mean literally, static, then the words, I have called you. Static. And then a completely different song is on in the middle of it. And sometimes God speaks to us in ways we don't imagine and brings us peace that we didn't know to ask for and accept. Because let me tell you, the separation between being schizophrenic and hearing the radio talk to you that it's God can be a very thin line. And yet I needed those words. Especially in our tradition, we aren't always sure that God actually says real words to us. And so to hear the real words was something that I needed because I was all over the place about what comes next and how do I take care of my little one because he was under 10 at that point. And to know that God had called me even though I didn't know what was next. To know that God was there with me even when I wasn't sure that God was hearing my cries was the words that I needed. So what words do you use to share that the kingdom of God has drawn near? I think about this when it's signs and symbols and feelings. So my son and I this week were out walking at Land's Inn in the Sutter Vest because he lives near there. And while we were walking, this hawk kept looking like it was going to die bomb us. But for me, these are amazing things. We don't see a lot of hawks in Illinois, especially not right in front of you. And they make you think about the wonder of creation, about the amazing mystery that is God that puts these things in our path that just make us stop and go, wow. Make us wonder about how amazing the place is that we've landed. And it's okay to talk about God in those terms. God, the mystery that made so many amazing things. Like there's this succulent that grows around here that I would have said, oh, it's this kind of flower and has this big stalk with these tiny little pink flowers on the top. But when you look down at the bottom, it's a succulent. Who knew that succulents make cute little pink flowers at the top? God has done such wonders. And sometimes that's how we talk about the kingdom. 
that God is the mystery that makes you stop and experience awe. And sometimes God is the peace that comes when you are troubled and discouraged and in need of hope. Sometimes God's presence and mystery is that feeling that even though this seems like the worst it has ever been, that there is more, that there is something better in store for us. But you have to remember that God does send you out. Like the better and more that's in store for us isn't going to happen if you don't take up your walking stick and boot. So how would you talk about the kingdom of God drawing near to you? What words would you use? What images would you say? And who would you share it with? <clears throat> but here's the thing Jesus does again. He says, if the tongue welcomes you, as you are leaving, tell them that the kingdom of God has drawn near. But if they aren't open to it, shake the dust off your feet and say, the kingdom of God has drawn near. Whether you're welcome or rejected, that God's movement, the Spirit's movement, the mystery that is at the heart of all of us has drawn near. It makes us think, right? That we, we like to hang around the people who are like us who believe the same things we believe, who share our insights and our understandings. And yet Jesus sends you out to people who are like you and unlike you. People who welcome you and don't welcome you. But Jesus doesn't say, clobber them over the head with your right ideas. He tells you to share your experience of the kingdom drawing near. So I want you to think about that this week. Maybe when you're out on your walk, every house you pass, you can say, peace be on this house. As you're leading your life this week, think about how God's presence is there with you. How God's wholeness and peace has been with you. And think about what you're packing to take with you. Think about what you need for the journey, the invitation to be sent out to share the love of God with a hurting world. Amen. Amen.